Candide by Voltaire, Chapter Thirteen: How Candide was forced away from his fair Cunegonde and the old woman. The beautiful Cunegonde, having heard the old woman's history, paid her all the civilities due to a person of her rank and merit. She likewise accepted her proposal, and engaged all the passengers, one after the other, to relate their adventures, and then both she and Candide allowed that the old woman was in the right. "'It is a great pity,' said Candide, "'that the sage Pangloss was hanged, contrary to custom at an auto de fe. He would tell us most amazing things in regard to the physical and moral evils that overspread the earth and sea, and I should be able, with due respect, to make a few objections. While each passenger was recounting his story, the ship made her way. They landed at Buenos Aires. Cunegonde, Captain Candide, and the old woman waited on the governor. Don Fernando de Barra y Figueroa y Mascarenas y Lampordos y Susa. This nobleman had a stateliness becoming a person who bore so many names. He spoke to men with so noble a disdain, carried his nose so loftily, raised his voice so unmercifully, assumed so imperious an air, and stalked with such intolerable pride that those who saluted him were strongly inclined to give him a good drubbing. Cunegonde appeared to him the most beautiful he had ever met. The first thing he did was to ask whether she was not the captain's wife. The manner in which he asked the question alarmed Candide. He durst not say she was his wife, because indeed she was not, neither durst he say she was his sister, because it was not so. And although this obliging lie had been formerly much in favor among the ancients, and although it could be useful to the moderns, his soul was too pure to betray the truth. "'Miss Cunegonde,' said he, "'is to do me the honor to marry me, and we beseech your excellency to deign to sanction our marriage.' Don Fernando de Barra y Figueroa y Mascarenas y Lampurdos y Susa, turning up his mustachios, smiled mockingly, and ordered Captain Candide to go and review his company. Candide obeyed, and the governor remained alone with Miss Cunegonde. He declared his passion, protesting he would marry her the next day in the face of the church, or otherwise, just as should be agreeable to herself. Cunegonde asked a quarter of an hour to consider of it, to consult the old woman, and to take her resolution. The old woman spoke thus to Cunegonde. "'Miss, you have seventy-two quarterings, and not a farthing.' It is now in your power to be wife to the greatest lord in South America, who has very beautiful mustachios. Is it for you to pique yourself upon inviolable fidelity? You have been ravished by Bulgarians. A Jew and an Inquisitor have enjoyed your favors. Misfortune gives sufficient excuse. I own that if I were in your place I should have no scruple in marrying the governor and in making the fortune of Captain Candide. While the old woman spoke with all the prudence which age and experience gave, a small ship entered the port on board of which were an alcalde and his alguazils. And this was what had happened. As the old woman had shrewdly guessed, it was a grey friar who stole Cunegonde's money and jewels in the town of Badajoz, when she and Candide were escaping. The friar wanted to sell some of the diamonds to a jeweler. The jeweler knew them to be the Grand Inquisitors. The friar, before he was hanged, confessed he had stolen them. He described the persons and the route they had taken. The flight of Cunegonde and Candide was already known. They were traced to Cadiz. A vessel was immediately sent in pursuit of them. The vessel was already in the port of Buenos Aires. The report spread that the alcalde was going to land, and that he was in pursuit of the murderers of my lord the Grand Inquisitor. The prudent old woman saw at once what was to be done. "'You cannot run away,' she said to Cunegonde, "'and you have nothing to fear, for it was not you that killed my lord. "'Besides, the governor who loves you will not suffer you to be ill-treated. "'Therefore, stay.' 
She then ran immediately to Candide. Fly, said she, or in an hour you will be burnt. There was not a moment to lose. But how could he part from Cunegonde, and where could he flee for shelter? End chapter 13 Chapter 14 How Candide and Cacambo were received by the Jesuits of Paraguay Candide had brought such a valet with him from Cadiz, as one often meets with on the coasts of Spain and in the American colonies. He was a quarter Spaniard, born of a mongrel in Tucuman. He had been singing-boy, sacristan, sailor, monk, peddler, soldier, and lackey. His name was Cacambo, and he loved his master, because his master was a very good man. He quickly saddled the two Andalusian horses. "'Come, master, let us follow the old woman's advice. Let us start and run without looking behind us.' Candide shed tears. Oh, my dear Cunegonde, must I leave you just at a time when the governor was going to sanction our nuptials? Cunegonde brought to such a distance. What will become of you? She will do as well as she can, said Cacambo. The women are never at a loss. God provides for them. Let us run. Whither art thou carrying me? Where shall we go? What shall we do without Cunegonde? said Candide. By St. James of Compostela, said Cacambo, you were going to fight against the Jesuits. Let us go to fight for them. I know the road well. I'll conduct you to their kingdom, where they will be charmed to have a captain that understands the Bulgarian exercise. You'll make a prodigious fortune. If we cannot find our account in one world, we shall in another. It is a great pleasure to see and do new things, eh? You have before been in Paraguay, then? said Candide. Aye, sure, answered Cacambo. I was servant in the College of the Assumption, and am acquainted with the government of the Good Fathers, as well as I am with the streets of Cadiz. It is an admirable government. The kingdom is upwards of three hundred leagues in diameter, and divided into thirty provinces. There the fathers possess all, and the people nothing. It is a masterpiece of reason and justice. For my part, I see nothing so divine as the fathers who here make war upon the kings of Spain and Portugal, and in Europe confess those kings, who here kill Spaniards, and in Madrid send them to heaven. This delights me. Let us push forward. You are going to be the happiest of mortals. What pleasure will it be to those fathers to hear that a captain who knows the Bulgarian exercise has come to them? As soon as they reached the first barrier, Cacambo told the advanced guard that a captain wanted to speak with my lord the commandant. Notice was given to the main guard, and immediately a Paraguayan officer ran and laid himself at the feet of the commandant to impart this news to him. Candide and Cacambo were disarmed, and their two Andalusian horses seized. The strangers were introduced between two files of musketeers. The commandant was at the further end, with the three-cornered cap on his head, his gown tucked up, a sword by his side, and a spontoon in his hand. He beckoned, and straightway the newcomers were encompassed by four-and-twenty soldiers. A sergeant told them they must wait, that the commandant could not speak to them and that the reverend father provincial does not suffer any Spaniard to open his mouth but in his presence, or to stay above three hours in the province. "'And where is the reverend father provincial?' said Cacambo. "'He is upon the parade, just after celebrating Mass,' answered the sergeant, "'and you cannot kiss his spurs till three hours hence.' However, said Cacambo, the captain is not a Spaniard, but a German. He is ready to perish with hunger as well as myself. Cannot we have something for breakfast while we wait for his reverence? The sergeant went immediately to acquaint the commandant with what he had heard. God be praised, said the reverend commandant. Since he is a German, I may speak to him. Take him to my arbor. Candide was at once conducted to a beautiful summer-house, ornamented with a very pretty colonnade of green and gold marble, and with trellises, enclosing parroquets, hummingbirds, fly-birds, guinea-hens, and all other rare birds. 
an excellent breakfast was provided in vessels of gold, and while the Paraguayans were eating maize out of wooden dishes in the open fields, and exposed to the heat of the sun, the Reverend Father Commandant retired to his arbor. He was a very handsome young man, with a full face, white skin, but high in color. He had an arched eyebrow, a lively eye, red ears, vermilion lips, a bold air, but such a boldness as neither belonged to a Spaniard nor a Jesuit. They returned their arms to Candide and Cacambo, and also the two Andalusian horses, to whom Cacambo gave some oats to eat just by the arbor, having an eye upon them all the while for fear of a surprise. Candide first kissed the hem of the commandant's robe. Then they sat down to table. "'You are, then, a German?' said the Jesuit to him in that language. "'Yes, reverend father,' answered Candide. As they pronounced these words, they looked at each other with great amazement, and with such an emotion as they could not conceal. "'And from what part of Germany do you come?' said the Jesuit. "'I am from the dirty province of Westphalia,' answered Candide. "'I was born in the castle of Thunder Tin Trunk. Oh, heavens! Is it possible? cried the commandant. What a miracle! cried Candide. Is it really you? said the commandant. It is not possible! said Candide. They drew back, they embraced, they shed rivulets of tears. What, is it you, reverend father? You, the brother of the fair Cunegonde? You that was slain by the Bulgarians? You, the barren son? You! a Jesuit in Paraguay. I must confess this is a strange world that we live in. Oh, Pangloss, Pangloss, how glad you would be if you had not been hanged. The commandant sent away the negro slaves and the Paraguayans, who served them with liquors in goblets of rock crystal. He thanked God and St. Ignatius a thousand times. He clasped Candide in his arms, and their faces were all bathed in tears. You will be more surprised, more affected, and transported, said Candide, when I tell you that Cunegonde, your sister, whom you believe to have been ripped open, is in perfect health. Where? In your neighborhood, with the governor of Buenos Aires, and I was going to fight against you. Every word which they uttered in this long conversation but added wonder to wonder. Their souls fluttered on their tongues, listened in their ears, and sparkled in their eyes. As they were Germans, they sat a good while at table, waiting for the Reverend Father Provincial, and the Commandant spoke to his dear Candide as follows. End Chapter 14 Chapter 15 How Candide Killed the Brother of His Dear Cunegonde I shall have ever present to my memory the dreadful day on which I saw my father and mother killed and my sister ravished. When the Bulgarians retired, my dear sister could not be found, but my mother, my father, and myself, with two maidservants and three little boys, all of whom had been slain, were put in a hearse to be conveyed for interment to a chapel belonging to the Jesuit, within two leagues of our family seat. A Jesuit sprinkled us with some holy water. It was horribly salt. A few drops of it fell into my eyes. The father perceived that my eyelids stirred a little. He put his hand upon my heart and felt it beat. I received assistance, and at the end of three weeks I recovered. You know, my dear Candide, I was very pretty, but I grew much prettier, and the Reverend Father Didrier, superior of that house, conceived the tenderest friendship for me. He gave me the habit of the order some years after I was sent to Rome. The Father General needed new levies of young German Jesuits. The sovereigns of Paraguay admit as few Spanish Jesuits as possible. They prefer those of other nations as being more subordinate to their commands. I was judged fit by the Reverend Father General to go and work in this vineyard. We set out, a Pole, a Tyrolese, and myself. Upon my arrival I was honored with a subdeaconship and a lieutenancy. I am today colonel and priest. We shall give a warm reception to the King of Spain's troops. 
I will answer for it that they shall be excommunicated and well beaten. Providence sends you here to assist us. But is it indeed true that my dear sister Cunegonde is in the neighborhood with the governor of Buenos Aires? Candide assured him on oath that nothing was more true, and their tears began afresh. The baron could not refrain from embracing Candide. He called him his brother, his savior. Ah, perhaps, said he, we shall together, my dear Candide, enter the town as conquerors and recover my sister Cunegonde. That is all I want, said Candide, for I intend to marry her, and I still hope to do so. You insolent, replied the baron. Would you have the impudence to marry my sister, who has seventy-two quarterings? I find thou hast the most consummate effrontery to dare to mention so presumptuous a design. Candide, petrified at this speech, made answer. Reverend father, all the quarterings in the world signify nothing. I rescued your sister from the arms of a Jew and of an inquisitor. She has great obligations to me. She wishes to marry me. Master Pangloss always told me that all men are equal, and certainly I will marry her. We shall see that, thou scoundrel, said the Jesuit baron de thunder tin trunk and that instant struck him across the face with the flat of his sword. Candide in an instant drew his rapier, and plunged it up to the hilt in the Jesuit's belly, but in pulling it out reeking hot, he burst into tears. "'Good God!' said he. "'I have killed my old master, my friend, my brother-in-law. I am the best-natured creature in the world, and yet I have already killed three men.' and of these three two were priests. Cacambo, who stood sentry by the door of the arbor, ran to him. We have nothing more for it than to sell our lives as dearly as we can, said his master to him. Without doubt some one will soon enter the arbor, and we must die sword in hand. Cacambo, who had been in a great many scrapes in his lifetime, did not lose his head. He took the baron's Jesuit habit, put it on Candide, gave him the square cap, and made him mount on horseback. All this was done in the twinkling of an eye. "'Let us gallop fast, master. Everybody will take you for a Jesuit, going to give directions to your men, and we shall have passed the frontiers before they will be able to overtake us.' He flew as he spoke these words, crying aloud in Spanish, Make way, make way, for the reverend father colonel! End chapter 15